Welcome to Lanier. We're glad all of you are here for worship today. Thank you for coming to be with us on this beautiful Sunday morning. You couldn't order a better day, could you? Just a few words of, of announcement. I hope all of you will sign the attendance register that uh, if they're in the pew, uh, that we might have a record of, of your worship with us this morning. The um, Promise keepers and the youth will meet this afternoon as, as usual. Please note in your bulletin that this coming Saturday is the day that we're going to have a craft uh, treasures and whatever. Treats. And treats. <laughs> Crafts, treasures, and treats sale. So uh, if you, you have some extra crafts to uh, bring, put them back in the, the center room on the left there. And they'll, they'll have them all out and ready to go on, on Saturday from 9 to 3. Come be with us. Help us with it. Uh, bring some people along with you to, uh, to buy the crafts too, okay? So please remember that this will be a big day for our building fund. Also, next Sunday is the Sunday that we uh, take the offering for Aldersgate Homes and Camp Collinswood which is our ministry to persons with developmental disabilities here in the North Georgia Annual Conference. Our church conference is next Sunday at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, I think most of us are going to have to do it by Zoom unless uh, any of you would like to drive over to Gainesville first uh, for the conference. It's a group conference, and it'll work just as well if we do it by Zoom, okay? So... Uh, Please keep that in mind. We will give you the information on, on the Zoom call, particularly those of you who are, who are church officers. Samaritan's Purse Collection is, is well underway. You received this week uh, a statement about the uh, uh, stewardship journey for this fall, uh, which is called a generosity. I, I hope that if you receive that card and you can be here on November the 7th, that will be the day when we dedicate the gifts for, for next year. If you can't be there on the 7th, mail it to us or just bring it and put it in the offering plate. And we will bring those gifts cards which have, have already been sent in and dedicate them on, on the 7th as we do the other gifts. So thank you again for, for being here today. We've got some visitors with us. We've got some who haven't been here in a while. It's always a joy to have you here at Lanier. Let's let's hang on just just a minute. Uh, we we jumped the stewardship minute, so we, if y'all don't mind being seated just one more time, we'll. Uh, you know. Uh, you know they used. They used to say that uh, a ship captain went to an Episcopal church, and they asked him how he how he knew when to stand and when to sit because they were up and down a whole lot of times in their order of worship. And he said, "I just rise and fall with the tide." So, uh, so this morning we're going to rise with the tide as as we hear Tommy come and share with us stewardship now. Good morning. How are you doing this morning? Good, good. Well, for anyone who doesn't know me, my name's Tommy Aiken. Uh, my wife Susan and I joined the church back in 1991. 
Yeah, that's like 30 years ago. And it seems like ages, a long, long time ago, but it's been a great journey. Uh, Recently, I was asked to share some thoughts on stewardship. So I decided to begin that by looking up the definitions. Uh, Google's a great thing. I found several definitions, and one I liked the best was uh, stewardship can be defined as utilizing and managing all resources that God provides for the glory of God and the betterment of his kingdom. So we're talking about stewardship. I like that definition because it encompasses all that God-given resources. That includes more than just our money. It's our time and our talents. As far as time goes, it seems like I have less and less time every day. And it's not just because falls here. Believe me, there's just too many things to do and not enough time to get them done. Regardless, it's important for all of us to spend some time here at the church graciously serving. Some of the opportunities for service that we have at Lanier don't really require much time, but uh, we have opportunities such as supporting a pastor in Liberia, um, supporting efforts for recovery from catastrophic events, assisting with the cost of care for seniors and children, on and on and on. Lanier has no shortage of opportunity for the betterment of God's kingdom. Of course, we also have facilities to maintain, apportionments to pay, salaries and bills, plus we have a desire to expand our facility this year. It's not as if I'm telling you anything you're not already aware of. I'm just uh, lifting up some opportunities. I've always believed in putting money in the plate when it's passed. It's, it's how I was raised. Um, but quite honestly, I really never liked the idea of pledging. It just seemed like... Uh, If if you knew that I was going to be here, I would donate. Why do you need to know in advance? Well, from years of seats in various council positions, I've realized how important it is for the church to have a budget and to have some idea what their income is going to be like. So uh, with this upcoming year, we're also going to be doing some financing, refinancing most likely. And uh, I would just ask that each of you Prayerfully consider your donations for the church and to fill out your commitment cards and return them to the church. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy, and we thank you for all those years of leadership and service that you've given to Lanier Church. Let's join now in singing together our hymn.
Let us join together in reciting the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to now for moments of silent prayer and meditation. O God of majesty and honor and glory, your goodness excels everything we imagine. Your interaction with us surprises us and blesses us in constantly new ways. As we enter this, your house this morning, we thank you for the world in which we live, for the gift of life, for hope for tomorrow, and strength for today. Lord, we confess that we've not lived up to your expectations of us. We've not loved our neighbor or ourselves as we should. Most of all, we've shortchanged you. Forgive our lapses in memory concerning the pain and suffering that your son underwent so that we might experience forgiveness and life in all its potential. Open our eyes to what he's done for us and our hearts to respond. We lift before you those who are, who are ill today. Help us to care for one another and do all we can to bring this pandemic to an end. Some of our number are undergoing treatments for cancer and other diseases. Be with them, O oh God, bringing healing and strength. There are others, Lord, who feel the presence of all that's, the pressure, rather, of all that's going on about us. Give them peace of mind and a sense of wholeness. God, let the division and separation that causes us to struggle in our society be calmed and healed. Indeed, may your church be a witness to the way. Draw us near, Lord, as we pray together the prayer our Lord taught his disciples to pray. For he told them when they prayed to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our Lord said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Remembering these words, let us worship God now 
with our tithes and our offerings. <coughs> Accept the Lord. Thought to himself, you know, 
I really want someone to love me. I want someone to take me home. I want to sleep on their fluffy bed. I want to cuddle with them. I want to just have the perfect life. But well, one day, a little girl picked up one and said, he's perfect. And he got so excited. They walked to his house. They walked to her house and they opened up the door and, and he was walking with her and, and he looked at, uh, in and they passed by his her bedroom and he thought, well, maybe I'm going to go to a different bedroom. But instead, they put him in this box. And in the box, they had some crayons and they had some soap and a, a washcloth and maybe a t-shirt and maybe some toys. And um, they put him in the box and he thought, why am I going in a box? And then they closed the box and it was dark and he got a little scared. So, but as he was going, he, he felt himself moving and then it opened up and it was so bright. He thought, oh, and someone came and looked and checked to make sure everything was in there. So toothpaste, they put some toothpaste in there, maybe some candy. And then he felt it flying in an airplane. And he thought, where am I going? This is so far. I just want to be, I just want someone to love me. I don't want to be stuck in a box. This is kind of weird. Plus the toothbrush was tickling his nose. And he thought, no, this is just not fun for me. Well then, all of a sudden he heard all these voices. He heard all these kids' voices. He got a little excited. And he thought, oh, what is happening? Well, then he felt himself being held by, a, by somebody. And he thought, oh, oh. What's going to happen? And then the box opened, and a little boy named Abu grabbed him and thought, oh, he's so perfect. I'm so excited. I love him. I love him. I will love him forever. He ran as fast as he could to his little hut and went over to his grandfather, and he put him down on his mat. And, you know, Mungo, even though it wasn't what he expected, was so loved and so cherished by this boy named Abu that he always felt love. And that's what this, that's my story for today. Do you like my story about Mungo? Well, what's precious about this story is there are people that live way, way, way far away on the other side of the world. And they don't have the things that we have. So we pack these little boxes for little boys and girls that live far, far away. And they will get these boxes and you put a little lovey in them, like a mongo, or you can put a bunny or whatever else, and then we're going to take it, and it's going to go to a very, very special boy or girl far, far away. And in that little box, the people that open it, um, they will put a little piece of paper in there, and it will tell them about Jesus. And that's the most important part, that we're reaching people far, far away. And you know what you can do when you take this box? You can put um, a little code on it, and you can watch where that goes. You can actually follow it and find out where it goes, and that's the best part. Every year I set a box, I love to see where it goes. You can also put some information about yourself in there and your address, and they might write you. I've actually, my kids have actually gotten letters. So this is a cool, cool thing to do. We at the church do this every year, so I encourage you to go shopping and you buy the things and fill up your box and bring it here and put it out there, put the shipping, chart, um, put the check in here for chip, shipping, um, and that way it'll get to a very special boy or girl far, far away. What do you think? Is that a cool story? Did you like my story about Mongo? Awesome. All right, well, let's go ahead and say a prayer. Father, we are so grateful and thankful, Lord, that we have the ability to do things for other people that live far, far away. Lord, we thank you and love you and ask that you help us to make good choices and help us remember no matter what we say and no matter what we do, you will always love me and you will always be with me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys are going to go with this cake back there. Morning. Today's scripture lessons from the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. Every high priest chosen among, from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is subject to weakness, and because of this he must offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as for those of the people. And one does not just presume to take this honor, but takes it only when called by God, just as Aaron was. 
So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Kim, and welcome to every one of you this morning. It's, it's our delight to have you in, in worship this, this beautiful day. Let's bow for just a moment of prayer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Compensation for pain and suffering. Well, I don't know about you, but when I, I hear those words, I, I think about the advertisements that I see almost daily on, on the uh, television or, or on signs where injury or um, accident attorneys are, are advertising, arguing about whose dog's bigger or, or whatever it is that they, they argue about. But as I... Uh, read this passage of scripture from Hebrews this morning. I admit I was a little confused about what it meant. Oh, there's all this in here about uh, Melchizedek. Um, and we need to talk about that some other time because it leads us down some other, other paths. But this particular passage is rather perplexing. For he speaks of, of Jesus' obedience through suffering. Having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Now we don't know how, as Hebrews says, he learned obedience through what he suffered. But we do know he agonized. And we can learn from that very agony. Even Christ could not avoid pain and complete his mission, and neither can we. You know, in this week of uh, professional baseball, playoffs, etc., an old Peanuts cartoon came to mind. It's both appropriate and uh, very instructive. Charlie Brown is walking away from Lucy after a game with his with his head down, all totally dejected. Another ball game lost. Good grief, Charlie moans. I get tired of losing. Everything I do, I lose. Lucy replies, look at it this way, Charlie Brown. We learn more from losing than we do from winning. And Charlie shouts back at Lucy, that makes me the smartest person in the whole world. Well, don't worry, Charlie Brown. you got a lot of company. And let's just pray it's not the praise. A nurse was, was walking, talking rather with a friend as she waited on a table at a restaurant. Work was pretty uneventful last night, she said. Then they brought in a guy who wanted to go fishing and got tired of, of blowing up his raft. He and his friend went down to the 7-Eleven then and, and filled it up in the, the, tire, the tire air machine. But then it wouldn't fit into his car. So the guy climbs on top of the car and stretches his arms over the top of the raft, holding it onto the roof while his friend drives. His wife's following behind them in their other car. And everything was going really well, she said, until... A big semi passed in the opposite direction, be doing about 60, and the draft caused the boat to, to lift off the car. Well, then this guy's airborne. First he flies up into the air, and, and then he lands on the trunk of the car. 
And finally, he crashes onto the road, and you guessed it, his wife ran over him. Fortunately, his only injury was, was a broken foot. You know, sometimes we just can't win. You can identify with that, can't you? Psychologist John Drakeford says that at any given time, one out of every ten people is going through a crisis experience. One out of ten people at any given time. That may surprise some of us, but maybe not others of us. Such situations are not strange at all in the Bible. Certainly there's pain and, and suffering and, and crisis. We remember Moses who's gazing over into the promised land that he would never enter. Hannah, downhearted, unable to eat because of a child that she's not able to bear. Elijah, fearing for his life, flees into the desert alone and miserable. The widow of Nain is enveloped in grief over the loss of her only son. The Gadarene demoniac is so emotionally wrought that he's mutilating himself. There's a woman with an issue of blood, 12 years of hemorrhaging, seeing doctor after doctor to, to no avail. Blind Bartimaeus, Mary and Martha at their brother's tomb, and of course, Jesus on the cross. The list goes on and on. The Bible speaks about suffering, all kinds of suffering, physical, emotional, spiritual. And God's people even in this day, know something about pain and disappointment and failure and grief. Dealing with adversity is nothing new to most of us. It's even to the point that we sometimes joke about it. John McKay, I think you may remember him with the Falcons, was one, one time the, the coach of, of the Tampa Bay Bucks when they weren't as good as they are right now. To put it kindly, that team was a disaster. And one day a reporter asked him what he thought about his, his team's execution. He pondered a moment and responded, I'm in favor of it. What, what life does to us is sometimes no joking matter. Pain seems inevitable. We'd rather not hear this thought. But some pain may be essential for our emotional and spiritual growth. Lucy may be right in her advice for Charlie Brown. You know, one of the most unusual facts in nature is discovered in, in the birds of, of New Zealand. This island nation has more flightless birds than any nation in the world. Among these birds are the kiwi and the penguin. Scientists tell us that these birds once had wings, but they lost them. Well, why? They didn't have any use for them. The birds had no natural predators, and, and food was, was plentiful. And since there was no reason to fly, they didn't. And through neglect, they lost their wings. Peter James Fleming tells about a young man who had been thrown from a horse and had been paralyzed. Slowly but surely, he began to show signs of recovery. They took him to a huge regional hospital for additional therapy. One day came when he was about to take his first step. The people who helped him stood aside. He moved forward but fell flat on his face. He wept in pain. Nobody moved. A chaplain who was a friend and confidant of the family felt instinctive to push, to rush to his side. But the therapist restrained him. Again the boy tried. Again the agony of the fall and the defeat. Again and again the cruelty continued for it could have indeed been seen as such. It was dreadfully painful to the younger man. It was painful to the therapist who watched. It was painful to the chaplain who empathized. But one day, this boy walked. 
The miraculous day came. Fleming contrasted his painful experience with a cartoon that he had seen that showed a mother helping her son into a wheelchair. A nearby voice said, I didn't know your son couldn't walk. And her reply was, oh, he can, but thank God he doesn't have to. From everything we know in Scripture, God is not like that mother. God is more like those therapists. God wants us to walk and run and soar. Now I realize and you realize that sometimes a complete healing doesn't happen. But we do know that God is about the business of soul building. God's will for us is not to make us happy or, or unhappy. It's to make us what we can be. To bring us fullness and growth. There's woven in the tapestry of our lives both, both pain and joy. God doesn't give up until we know our intended stature in Jesus Christ. My friend Jeff Ross wrote an article the other day that really speaks to what I'm trying to say to you this morning. He said, God explodes into the lives of his people in a rich variety of ways. For us to try and lasso that in and say, well, this is the way or that is the way makes absolutely no sense at all. We don't come to faith the same way. We didn't all attend the same worship service, the same retreats, the same conferences, go on the same mission trips, or gather in the same type of small groups. We didn't all start our days with a a quiet time, or, or pray in the same way. Our job is not to pick the team, evaluate the team, or question the selection process. Our job is to play the position God puts us in. When the ball comes our way, we're to catch it, block it, tackle it, or run from it, depending upon whatever the call of God is upon our lives. Then God takes what may seem to be like a mess to us and makes it work. God redeems it and gives it life. How we like to, to take the Deuteronomy code and believe that good things happen to good people and less than good things happen to scoundrels. But the psalmist says, our ways are not God's ways. The author of Hebrews is right. There's something instructive about suffering. Dr. Samuel Zwemer noted the striking fact that the only thing Jesus took pains to show after his resurrection was his scars. The only thing he took pains to show his scars. His disciples didn't recognize him or the message on the road to Emmaus. Not until he broke the bread and they saw the scars with their eyes open. When he stood in the midst of his demoralized disciples in the upper room after the resurrection, he showed them his hands and his side. Certainly, suffering reminds us of our dependence in God. Early in our lives, we think that, uh, that we're in control of everything, that we're nearly invincible. Then suddenly something comes along and reminds us of our mortality. We're clear that we're not in control. And so we turn to a power greater than our own. And we discover there a friend closer than a brother or sister who, who understands our need. But you see, Jesus Christ has experienced the whole range of human emotions. Well, maybe, just maybe, that's what the writer of Hebrews meant when he said that Christ learned obedience through suffering. We talk about compensation for, for pain and, and suffering when someone is at fault, but here suffering is a great teacher. It teaches us compassion for others. It teaches us dependence on God. 
While God doesn't set out to bring this pain and suffering upon us, it appears that even in the worst life offers, there's compensation provided by a gracious God. I know most of you have heard the beautiful voice that, that comes from Julio Iglesias. Well, you may not know the rest of the story. He'd been a successful professional soccer player in Madrid. When a car crash ended his career and left him paralyzed for about a year and a half. A sympathetic nurse, for some unknown reason, gave him a, a guitar to pass his time while he was, was in the hospital. Though he'd had no prior musical aspirations, he turned his energy to singing. And you hear the results in that magnificent voice. His accident marked a watershed event in his life, a turning point after which everything changed. Compensation for pain and suffering? Maybe. I pray at least that we'll keep our eyes open to new possibilities. I've always loved that line from The Sound of Music that has Maria saying, Reverend Mother says, every time God closes a door, somewhere he opens a window. Let us pray. Lord, we struggle when we think about the pain and suffering that's come into our lives. We know that you don't rain it down upon us, but we know you're there with us to help us handle it, to make something of it. Now, oh Lord, we ask that you will help us resign ourselves to you that we might truly find the strength that only comes through your Son. Through him we pray. Amen. As we sing our closing hymn this morning, as there are those of you who would like to spend a few moments at the altar of this church, it's always open to you. If there are any who would like to become a part of the fellowship of this church, that possibility is always there as well. So let's stand as we sing together. Thank you.